I'm Andy Agel. I'm from the city's Housing and Economic Development Department, and I'd like to welcome all of you this morning to this forum. I want to give you a little bit of background. After the city of Los Angeles voted to implement a minimum wage, our city council in June directed city staff to work on an ordinance that would implement a similar minimum wage here in Santa Monica. They also asked that we do some outreach to consider what are unique elements that should be a part of that ordinance as it relates to Santa Monica. And let me make one side note. I, I think there's been some, some um, discussion that Santa Monica may be adopting a different minimum wage level than Los Angeles. That's not our, our understanding. Our understanding of the direction from council is that we'd be considering a wage structure that would mirror Los Angeles <coughs> in terms of what the, what the minimum wage levels are and when they're implemented over the coming years. As part of council's direction, they also asked us that we, um, we <coughs> seek expert advice with respect to minimum wages and the appropriate considerations for Santa Monica. And we were very fortunate that Dr. Reich agreed to assist us in this process. We'll be holding another one of these forums next Tuesday afternoon. And then in early September, we'll be holding a forum that's focused on nonprofits. We, um, we encourage you to attend any of these. Just, a, um, just in terms of timing, we're anticipating that we'll go back to the city council in late September with um, recommendations, summary of feedback. And if any of you would like to be notified of that meeting, if you signed up outside, we will send you a notification of when the city council is going to consider the issue. We'll also send you a link to a, uh, an informational report that we prepared that includes links to a variety of the studies that were done, particularly related to the city of Los Angeles. And that may be interesting background for you. <coughs> Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. One is there are restrooms, if you take a left outside and go into the outdoor corridor, turn left, there are restrooms there. We're videotaping this meeting. We got some feedback from um, some community members who weren't able to attend this meeting or next week. They asked that we record it and we'll put it on the city's website so those that weren't able to come today <coughs> are able to take a look at what happened. And then there are other city staff members who may be helping if there are specific um, city questions that come up. Gigi Decavalos Hughes, who's our finance director, Stephanie Lizicki from the finance department, and Jason Harris and Jennifer Taylor from economic development are here. So they may be helping as we go along. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Wright. He is a professor of economics, and he's also the director of the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, which is known as the IRLE, at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard. And his research publications cover numerous areas of labor economics and political economy, including the economics of racial inequality, the analysis of labor market segmentation, historical stages in US labor markets and social structures of accumulation, high performance workplaces, union management cooperation, and Japanese labor management systems. The Berkeley IRLE has won widespread national and international recognition for its many <coughs> rigorous and influential studies of minimum wage impacts, including from the White House and from the US Senate and House committees. And Dr. Reich's work is recognized as among the most important academic research on the economic impact of minimum wage laws over the last two decades. Dr. Reich, with his team at IRLE, worked on both a prospective study of Mayor Garcetti's initial minimum wage proposal, as well as an in-depth analysis that was commissioned by the LA City Council's Economic Development Committee. A peer review of this and two other major analyses of the LA minimum wage increase concluded that the UC Berkeley study provided the best supported and most reasonable assessment of the minimum wage's likely impact for the city and the region. In addition to work for Los Angeles, Dr. Reich and the team at Berkeley carried out an analysis of the city of Se Seattle on the impacts of local minimum wage laws on workers, families, and businesses, and prepared analyses of proposed minimum wage laws in Oakland, San Francisco, and San Diego. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Reich. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here, and thank you for the Santa Monica staff for setting this up and also with providing me some 
of the statistics that I was hoping to have for, for this uh, presentation. Uh, Santa Monica is a pretty small city and I don't have the data uh, at the micro level that I had, that we had for Los Angeles. So I'm necessarily just gonna skip over some of the things we did uh, or that we could do for Santa Monica and instead a lot of this report will be what we found for Los Angeles and the implications for, for Santa Monica. Uh, also, I wanna mention that I, I think this whole new development of citywide minimum wages is very exciting. It's happening all over the country, as probably a lot of you know. Uh, in fact, there's a New York Times story today and, and by Noam Scheiber about what minimum wages different cities can afford around the country, large cities. And I'm quoted very nicely in that, so it's a little plug for me and for the New York Times. It'll be in the print edition tomorrow. It's in the online edition today. Also, uh, I've been studying low-wage labor markets for a long time, since I was a graduate student in economics, and um, Lyndon Johnson was the president then, so that tells you how old I am. In, in the interim, uh, the number of low-wage workers and the problem of inequality has only grown, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons we're now seeing this upsurge in, in, in policies to, to raise the minimum wage, especially at the state and local levels. <coughs> Excuse me. So let me tell you what I'm going to cover today. Um, I guess I have to use this guy. Yeah, I, I want to do a little bit of comparison. Thank you for the lights. Yeah, is that easier to see? Uh, compare Santa Monica and Los Angeles. Uh, they're not really comparable in size, but in other ways we can compare them. Uh, I then will talk a little bit, uh, th theoretically really, about how minimum wages are absorbed by business, especially by workers and by local economy, based on uh, studies that we've been doing, of some of which um, was Andy, right, who, men who, who mentioned, and also previous research, more scholarly uh, research for, for academic publications that I've done, analyzing the effects of minimum wages over the period from 19, well, really 1979 to 2014. Most of those are state minimum wages as well as federal minimum wages. And then I'll tell you what we found for Los Angeles. We'll talk, I'll talk about the impacts on workers' business and the local economy. I'll present with, to you some of the other uh, cities uh, that are having a local, already have local minimum wage laws and a brief wrap up on what the likely impacts are uh, for Santa Monica. Okay? So, um, and oh yeah, and my focus is gonna be on the economic facts. I'm an economist. I'm not a lawyer or, uh, you know, I'll get up in the, wrapped up in the details of, of uh, which nonprofits should be excluded from minimum wage and which shouldn't. That's uh, covered somewhat by the rest of my team, and one of them will be here on September 8th to fo focus simply uh, solely on the nonprofits because they are um, a, a difficult issue, uh, especially um, when the minimum wage gets much higher than, than it has been. Uh, they have some issues. Okay, this is the proposal that the Los Angeles uh, City Council approved and the mayor signed, uh, I think they approved it in May and the mayor signed it, Mayor Garcetti signed it in June. And from what I understand, what just said by Andy, uh, Santa Monica is considering a similar schedule. So it doesn't go into effect for nearly a year. Uh, in the meantime, the state minimum wage will be going up to $10. So the first effect will only be 50 cents higher as a five cent, five percent difference, and then it jumps to by a dollar uh, and a half, a uh, dollar and a quarter, and a dollar, <laughs> and then 75 cents. I didn't come up with this, you know, but the schedule I think was a compromise. Um, the, the report that we prepared was at, we asked we were asked to look at what the impacts would be for 13.25 in 2017, and then 1525 in 2019. So the numbers I'm gonna to present to you are, come from that report, but they're not that, uh, you know, the numbers wouldn't vary that much if we use the actual policy that was enacted. As, as I say there, if you're a small uh, organization with 25 or fewer employees, you can delay for a year till 20, each step you can delay for a year till 2021. 
uh, and then the nonprofits uh, will get uh, the opportunity to apply for next year if they serve uh, disadvantaged workers in transition where they get most of their funding from government grants because the problem of funding comes up and if they have a certain ratio I think is less than eight to one of the pay of the CEO to the pay to the lowest paid workers in the organization. The indexing uh, will um, indexing means that we adjust the minimum wage every year, starting in 2022 in this case, to uh, rates of inflation to ensure that the minimum wage does not fall behind um, uh, in real terms, inflation adjusted terms. About 15 states now do this kind of indexing and um, about, I think most of the cities actually uh, will, will do, do so as well. And. Um, in Los Angeles it adopted this is a very unusual way to, in, to index, which is to use a 20-year rolling average. I'm not sure whether this was something that business wanted more, or labor wanted more, or, or whatever. What a 20-year rolling average means is that you uh, average over the previous 20 years, and the next year you average over the, also the previous 20 years, but you're starting a year later and ending a year later. So it's a, it'll be an indexation that will be um, very insensitive to current rates of inflation, but more sensitive to previous years of inflation. As it turns out, inflation is a lot lower today than it was 15 <coughs> and 20 years ago. Um, so this method will, use, will, will imply a higher cost of living adjustment. In most cases, uh, cities just index and states to the current rate of inflation as measured by the uh, consumer price index for the, for the locality or, or the state or, or, or whatever. And, it, and then there'll be an enforcement office that will be set up initially with five employees, and I think they're planning to go up to 25 over time, which we recommended, uh, and with, based on the, the experience of San Francisco, which has, uh, I think, about 11 uh, inspectors at this point, and of course, San, uh, Los Angeles is many times bigger. Okay. Um, so, in, wait a minute, you know what? This is not my, uh, this is not the version I thought I had. <laughs> but we had to use a different laptop. It, uh, so I'm a little bit outside the outline, I guess. But that's okay, it's not a problem. We'll just keep going. And I think the comparisons to Santa Monica will show up later. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's see. So uh, what I'll do um, with this first draft version that I prepared is just go through the uh, analysis we did in Los Angeles. The first point is that minimum wage or low wage workers are um, not in every industry in the same proportions. Some industries are lower wage and others manufacturing is pretty high wage except for apparel manufacturing which there are quite a few jobs in uh, Los Angeles, and we were quite concerned about the mobility of those jobs. We think that what will happen to those jobs is a lot of them will move to Vernon or some other nearby city, and that the work, the jobs won't disappear, and the workers won't lose their jobs. They'll just be uh, going to a slightly different address to, to work. And uh, on the other hand, Los Angeles City will lose a tax revenue from that, uh, from having those plants located there. The people in the Economic Development Agency at Los, in Los Angeles said there were plenty of, of uh, applicants to, uh, to use the land at a higher level than the apparel industry did, so they weren't worried about the loss of tax revenue. Okay, so, so, that, so the manufacturing, of course, does not really exist within Santa Monica, as far as I know, but maybe there's a little bit. So, so the composition will, will be a little different here. Uh, so these are the, the industries that usually come up. Um, sometimes you see accommodation and food services lumped together depending on, on how the, the data are classified. And here we've separated them out. Uh, that's by far the biggest group. of uh, they, most, they not only account for more low-wage workers than any other group, but low-wage workers are a higher proportion of their workforce than any other group. And then within restaurants, the, the, it's even more the case for fast food restaurants than for uh, full service restaurants. 
Okay. Healthcare and social assistance is a variety uh, of, uh, but there are a lot of variety of low wage jobs in there, including low paid jobs in hospitals, low paid jobs in long term nursing homes, child care, uh, and of course the social assistance nonprofits. Retail trade is, is uh, up there, and then uh, <coughs> industries that are classified as temporary agencies, janitorial security guards, and, uh, uh, which are within the administrative and waste management services category of the Census Bureau. I, I, I love this label because it seems to, I don't really love it, I dislike it, but because it seems to suggest that administrative management is not waste. It's only, you know, <laughs> waste management is waste, but it's, it's, anyway, that's the story there. Ah, here's one of my Santa Monica slides. Maybe I just put it in the wrong place. So, uh, comparing Santa Monica and Los Angeles, <clears throat> and remembering where the biggest impact is uh, in, in food services or restaurants, uh, to, uh, take a look at this chart. Here, what you can see is that, can you see it in the back? Is it, is it pretty clear? Good. Yeah, good, okay. So, uh, private sector employment in Santa Monica, it's about 80,000. Um, LA is 1.5 million. You can do the math. I think that's, is that 20 to 1 or 200 to 1? I think it's 200 to 1. Um, uh, 160? No, 20 to 1. 20 to 1, right. Okay, so Santa Monica is only 5% of the size of, San, of, of LA City. This is employment, and this is just private sector because the coverage of the law only extends to the private sector. It does not extend to public sector workers or uh, employees of the uh, LA uh, Unified School District uh, and, and other uh, ca categories, because the locality can't set wages for these other entities. And uh, just to focus on how Santa Monica's industrial distribution is different besides the fact that there's no manufacturing, is much more uh, intensively in accommodations and food services than LA City is. That 10.2 percent for LA City is even even that's a little high compared to the national average, which is probably about nine uh, nine percent. And uh, so it's nearly double that in Santa Monica, which of course you know reflects the fact that there's a lot of tourism in in, in Santa Monica. And then notice that uh, what I calculated from the help with the help of the Santa Monica uh, Economic Development and Finance Agency is that average weekly <coughs> pay is higher in Santa Monica in these same industries than it is in LA City. So, you, uh, and it's quite a bit higher, not uh, astronomically so, but substantially so. So, what this table tells you, what the takeaway is, is that even though Santa Monica has more uh, employment in industries that are traditionally low wage, not just in Los Angeles, but around the country, they're better paid in in uh, Santa Monica than in, in Los Angeles. So uh, I, I suspect, uh, and I'll come back to this later, that the impact will be a lot lower in Santa Monica than, <coughs> than it will be in, in, San, in uh, Los Angeles. The impact on employment or the other ways that, that the uh, minimum wage will need to be absorbed. So. Um, Oh, I've got some animation here, I didn't realize. <laughs> uh, let me talk a little bit theoretically then about what um, are the ways that minimum wage gets uh, absorbed. The one that we usually hear about is that if you raise the uh, price of labor, you're going to hire less of it. Just like if the price of chicken goes up in the supermarket, you're going to buy less of it, right? That's called the, in Econ 1, we call that the downward sloping demand curve. And it makes a lot of sense. However, we, we also teach in Econ 1 that the labor the supply side of the market is also important, not just the demand side. And labor supply will be affected by uh, an increased minimum wage. In particular, a lot of studies, including some of my own, but not just my own, find that when you increase the, the wage, that in a causal sense, not just a correlation, that turnover goes down of your lowest wage workers. That is to say, work, it's easier to recruit workers and easier to retain them. And of course, if they're there longer, which they are, then you can expect some improved employee performance simply from the fact 
that there's learning on the job, or maybe you're <coughs> more, uh, as an employer, you're more motivated to train them, and they're more motivated to accept the training. So, um, so that's a labor supply effect. It does not mean that the employers can raise their wages and keep the same profits as before, uh, just through this turnover effect. The turnover offsets about 15% of the increase in the cost of wages. So it's not going to happen on its own, although it's, uh, as we get into a, a lower and lower unemployment labor market, we are finding that quite a few companies are raising their, min their own minimum wage, like Walmart, Target, and, and, and McDonald's, for example. Uh, have announced such as IKEA also, and they expressly have said they do that because they want to lower turnover and raise employee morale, employee performance, the gap. It's, a, it's another company that's been active in that area. So even though that happens through the uh, voluntarily through the market, it happens even more when all firms are compelled to raise their their minimum wage through a minimum wage law. Okay. So <clears throat> to keep that in mind. Another concern with when you raise the minimum wage is that if labor gets more expensive, you're going to substitute, employers will substitute more equipment for labor. And I know that there have been billboards all over the country and ads in various papers saying that the new minimum wage employee will be an iPad. That is to say, you'll, you'll uh, put in your order at the table or at the counter using an electronic piece of electronic equipment and that will get rid of cashiers and reduce or eliminate a lot of jobs. And um, while that's theoretically the case, there will be an increased incentive to, to automate. We have some experience with how much automation actually occurs. And um, I spent a lot of time researching this. Uh, there, there is, in fact, um, in automation, that is, uh, the, the uh, pay systems now are very different from what they were 25 years ago, right, or 30 years ago, with, with the advent of computers and electronic systems. There hasn't been as much change in, in restaurants in food prep. That's, that's hardly changed at all. Um, it has changed around the edges, but there, there hasn't been that much change. And in, in, indeed, I've, uh, I'm aware that there is a, a robot out there that will prepare your hamburger and put in the salad, the lettuce and tomatoes and onions and so on to your specifications and put it in a bag. But as far as I know, even though it's been available for 10 years, no one's actually adopted it. So the technological possibilities here are more limited than one might think. And, they're very, and especially compared to retail, where retail has been transformed enormously in the last 25 years with, with, uh, autom through automation. Think of the big box retail stores that you know, replaced all the mom and pop stores. Uh, because they've been able to use computer technology. Uh, Walmart, for example, knows that if there's a storm watch in Florida, that it should send a lot of plywood to Florida because there's going to be a lot of you know, need for uh, boarding up windows. And they know that very, very quickly because they've invested so heavily in their information technology system. So what's interesting about this um, adjustment channel that, that a lot of even economists don't realize or don't think about is that we're not just talking about the possibility that the cost of labor might rise. We have to really, to look at the incentives properly, we have to say or look at what happens to the cost of, of equipment, cost of capital, or the price of capital, which is, or the price of borrowing capital, which is the real interest rate. And the, the incentive to automate is a product of the relative price of capital to the relative price of labor. We don't always get to this point in Econ 1, but in Econ 100, the intermediate course, we certainly spent a lot of time on it. And as, if you think about it, real interest rates have been falling for a very long time, and they've been close to zero as in interest rates adjusted for inflation, uh, since, since, certainly since 2009, and, and were, were very low even before that. The price of capital, according to economists' measures, has also fallen. Again, it's mainly computers that have um, you know, had so much technological advancements has lowered uh, their, the costs of a computer. And so th th those decreases in the price of capital have been huge. So we've had the experiment of what happens when labor becomes um, not more expensive, but becomes a lot more expensive relative to, to machines, 
to electronic machines especially. And as I said, that's had a big effect on retail, but it hasn't on restaurants. So in each case, you can't just argue, oh, well, we know that there'll be fewer jobs when there's um, the price of labor goes up. It, it's not that simple. You have to kind of know what the actual technological possibilities are, substituting uh, equipment for labor, and they're very different in different industries. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I concluded, in fact, that for Los Angeles, the amount of further automation, uh, given what the, uh, the, the price increases would be, the wage increases would be, would be actually pretty uh, moderate. So small increases in prices and smaller declines in sales. Most uh, low-wage employers don't actually want to cut back on employment because then they can't serve as many customers. I hear this over and again from chief executives, say, of the, uh, what is it, Five Burger and Fat Burger, and I don't know, those are restaurants around here. Um, what they'd rather do is raise prices. Now, now, an individual restaurant doesn't want to raise prices, but when all restaurants face the same or all employers face the same cost increase, then each one will have the same pressure and will be able to raise its prices that uh, would not fly in the case of one restaurant in, uh, raising its price. This is very important because the restaurant owners often say, oh, well, we have a very small profit margin, you know, 5%, and that's markup over costs, and if the minimum wage goes up from $10 to $15, that's a 30, uh, I mean, 50 percent increase, and that means we're going to have to raise the price of our hampers by 50 uh, or cents, which we can't do. Or uh, if we absorb it out of profits, we'll go out of business, and and that's a very misleading um, calculation. Uh, in, in fact, the price increases won't go up by 50 percent when the minimum wage goes up. And I want to dwell on this for a moment because it took me a long time to understand it. So if you raise uh, the minimum wage by, uh, from $10 to $15, say you did it overnight, rather than uh, until 21, like 2021 or, uh, and so on, uh, how much will that increase a typical employer's wage costs? Well, not by 50%, because a lot of the employer employees in whatever industry, including in, in fast food restaurants, are already getting paid more than $10, right? And in the upper end restaurants, they're getting paid close to 15 or, or maybe over 15 or under 15. So that the average wage increase, uh, not, not the, not the uh, nominal increase of the law, but the actual wage increase we find is uh, on the average about half of, of, the, of, of what's the mandated increase, okay? And that's just the fact that in all industries, wages vary, and for different employees. So instead of 50% increase, you've got a 25% increase in, in, in payroll costs. Then we knock off 15% uh, for the reduced employee costs. 15% of 25% is about, about 6, 4%. No, so that goes from 25% to 21%. So that's the true increase in the, in the wage costs uh, after the employee turnover offset. Then you have to compare the wage costs uh, as a share of operating costs. Firms are marking up prices based on their operating costs, not just on their wage costs. So if their wage costs are a very small proportion of their operating costs, as is the case in retail, it's only 11% of um, costs are labor costs then you multiply that 21% by 11% to get the actual increase in operating costs. So that would be a little over 2%, 2.5% or something for retail. And that would be the, the amount by which uh, retailers could increase their prices without hurting their profits. And we think that's in fact what goes on, not just from my work, but from a lot of people's work around the country, both in minimum wage context and other contexts as well. For restaurants, the labor share of operating costs is about a third, and it stayed that way for, has stayed that way for a long time. So if I had, oh, it was before 21%, and then you multiply that by a third, that's 7%. So you could kind of expect 
at a 50% minimum wage increase results in only about a 7% increase in prices in, in restaurants. And this is our, you know, the ma magic of arithmetic. It's not the, it, the, there's nothing here that I've assumed that's controversial, and in fact, it's accepted by all minimum wage uh, scholars. And I men mention it because it's so often emphasized that, you know, the price of hamburgers will go get so high and nobody will want to buy them or, or, or whatever. There is a limitation, which is that if prices go up a lot and or even by a small amount, and some people will go down the market. They won't go to a high-end restaurant. They'll go to a low-end restaurant or to a fast food restaurant, or fast food restaurant sales will go down. And we know what those, uh, what they're called demand elasticities, is how much sales respond to a price increase are for some industries, but not for all increase, uh, industries. And we've taken that into account in our uh, study of Los Angeles. So, so as I say there in that box, um, oops, now my, there we go. Small increases in prices and smaller, and, and it's even smaller decline in sales based on what those demand elasticities are. Uh, and then the final box is increased consumer demand, which, which comes from wage increases at the low end. So people uh, at the low and the middle income tend to consume everything that they uh, earn. They don't have any net savings. Uh, it's in, in, at the very bottom or in bad times, they actually borrow and go, go into debt, as, as we know. Uh, so savings begin quite a bit higher in the income scale. They're very concentrated among the, the rich. And the difference is that at the top, savings, or rather spending, is 70% of total income, where it's 100% of total income for the people at the bottom. So what that means is an increase in the income for people in the lowest uh, wage categories, it results in a pretty substantial increase in their spending. And um, that means that consumer demand goes up, and it's gonna go up, in, uh, as it turns out, not by any mathematical requirement, about the same amount that the uh, this third box, decline in sales, uh, goes down. The two tend to offset each other. And this is very important because you often hear about this box from uh, uh, often opponents of minimum wage, and you often hear about this box from the advocates of minimum wage. And I want to assure you that we're taking both of those into account. It turns out they actually uh, turn out to, to offset each other. So, um, so that's to say that the, the, what we find in a lot of studies, and we found from Los Angeles, there's a pretty small automation effect, if any, and that these two boxes here cancel each other out, and so that the effect on employment or on economic activity is actually pretty small. Instead, what's mainly happening is that people, say, who work in restaurants uh, are getting higher uh, wages, and the people who uh, uh, are customers at restaurants are paying slightly higher prices, and that, that's uh, it's a really a redistribution from one group, from, from the second group to the first, and um, not much else is really upset. Uh, the economy doesn't blow up or anything of that sort. So um, here's a source for where you can find our our, our study. Um, this is this um, tells you about coverage, which I've already mentioned. And so the next few slides are about covered workers only, not about all workers in Los Angeles. And here it's pretty hard to read, but basically you've got a percent of the covered workforce that's affected. And remember, this is of the 2019 scenario. What was the website again? Uh, yeah. uh, think, think of early, I R L E. And it's just www.irle.berkeley.edu. And you'll see a lot of links to our, our studies there. By the way, there's a, a comparable or, organized research unit at UCLA here. So it, we, we were created in uh, 1945. So we've been, we've been around for a while. Um, so if you read down to here, the 41% of the uh, covered workers in Los Angeles will get a raise increase according to our estimates. That's a really high number, 
It's a very bold policy. In, in most of the increases in 1979 to 2013, 14, whether they were federal or state, the, the comparable amount was about 6%. And um, uh, LA is not alone anymore now in this level, but it's really quite a big, uh, in magnitude, quite a big jump. Attention staff, the library will be opening in a few minutes. Please okay. report to your workstations. Anybody need to report to their workstations? <laughs> I'm already at mine here, so okay. Um, so that's that, and, and and this includes looking both at the directly affected, those who get, have to get increased to fifteen dollars, and those who were at fourteen ninety nine or fifteen oh one, who are their supervisors, who will also get a bump, which we call the ripple effect or the indirect effect, and it's I think usually about twenty five percent of the total number of workers getting increases are getting them indirectly. And we know that from past studies, so we're taking that into account. Now, I'm not going to scare you with you know all these spend time on all these numbers, but since just look at say food service here, um, our calculation of the percent sees the percent change in payroll costs was about 20 uh, percent, and the we used a higher average labor cost to be conservative. And we came out with a predicted change in operating costs or in prices too of 7.8 percent. That's close to the numbers I was uh, spilling out for you before. Except this is now allowing time to take to, to intervene. That is, it's not having all at one on one day, but over five years. Yeah. Um, do um, do your numbers here um, reflect? Change that you'll have to give uh, financially to all other employees who were making what they were before. So I mean, like yeah, that's what the ripple effect, the indirect effect, is here. So the indirect effect goes up uh, somewhat. It doesn't go all the way up to wage distribution, okay. uh, based on a lot of statistical studies, not not just mine. So yeah, so someone it might go up in this case to sixteen fifty or even seventeen dollars, but I don't think it'll go any higher than that. And this is. Just more examples, here's retail trade, which because it only has a labor share of 11%, actually has a very low uh, potential increase in, in prices. Uh, this slide shows uh, that the, uh, the impacts are concentrated among smaller businesses and then among larger businesses, which uh, is, is uh, not necessarily obvious uh, beforehand, but it does turn out to be the case in, in, you know, with our study. And here, we, what we've done is computed the total effect for the economy of Los Angeles City and Los Angeles County. And there are a couple of uh, additional wrinkles here to, to tell you about. But uh, just to give you the bottom line of the table, for LA, um, this is city and this is, wait a minute. Um, yeah, the top part is the city, and this is the part of the county. So for the city, we expected some employment loss, um, including about 0.2% of employment, what is it, 3,500 jobs. So it's not the case there would be no employment loss, but on net, there would be a very small employment loss. This doesn't mean that no business will go out of, uh, no, no, uh, will, will fail. Uh, some businesses, according to studies of the Chicago Federal Reserve Bank, uh, fail when there's a minimum wage increase more than they otherwise would, and but also new entries come in at a higher rate, replacing those. So there will be some churning among employers. Uh, that, 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 that's the expectation. But what we're talking about here is not what happens to individual businesses, but what happens on net industries, uh, businesses as a whole. And notice for LA County that the number turns positive, uh, but small. The reason for this difference is that a lot of the workers who live in Los Angeles City, who, I'm sorry, who work in Los Angeles, live outside of the city and live in the rest of the county. There are a lot of in commuters. And so there's some leakage. So even though they may get uh, paid more, they're not actually going to spend that money within the city. They'll spend it in wherever they live. So if they live in Santa Monica, they're more likely to spend most of their money in Santa Monica than in, in LA. Uh, on the other hand, for a city as small 
at Santa Monica, there's a lot of, of uh, even a lot more in commuters, probably, and I couldn't find data on this, but it's probably the case that a very high percentage of people who work in Santa Monica don't live in Santa Monica, right? Especially low-wage workers, as the rents are high and all the rest. So, so for that reason, you're going to have some, um, you'll have some <coughs> benefits because LA raised its minimum wage. If you have residents who who commute into Los Angeles, but you'll also um, have some leakage back into LA when, when Santa Monica raises the minimum wage. Hope, hope that is clear. Um, but we, we, we were surprised to find out how small these effects were. Okay, these are cities and counties with other minimum wages, and th this table is too big. There's too many numbers on it to to read well. But um, some of them are poor cities like Albuquerque and New Mexico, in New Mexico, um, or Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico, Louisville. Not all are going to 15, of course. Oakland has just gone to 12, 25, um, and this table is actually out of date because uh, New York State is going to $15 for fast food workers, both in New York City and in the rest of the state. And, um, and other cities are considering increases to, to $15. So it isn't just Seattle, San Francisco, and, and Los Angeles that are at 15, Chicago is at 13, and New York at least partly is at 15, and I know of other campaigns in process. Uh, final thoughts, and then I'll take any more questions, is um, even without the proposed Santa Monica law, there's gonna be pressure on employers here to raise their wages. Uh, that's because if you have somebody who's working here and getting, say, 12 or $13 an hour, but they can get 15 in Los Angeles, they're, they may think about switching jobs and to hold on to your workers or to uh, attract new ones, you may very well find you're, you're gonna raise your wages. And so there'll be an upward pressure on, on wages in, in any case, um, which means that the additional effect of having a law is less than you might, you might think. Uh, Second point is that coordinating minimum wage policies on a regional basis is really a good idea, a good policy idea. Um, <clears throat> and we find that slowly happening, e even when there are, um, you know, there are a lot of egos involved, political egos involved. So for example, the small city and poor city of Richmond in the East Bay uh, next to Berkeley is raising its minimum wage to 12 uh, 50, Berkeley is going to 12.53, Oakland is going to 12.25, it's already gone to 12.25, and Berkeley's headed toward 15. Emeryville, an even smaller city, is, uh, is heading toward 16. Those are c cities in the East Bay, and the mayors have called for regional coordination, but they haven't really done it yet. And San Francisco, of course, is going to 15. Uh, similar effects have occurred in other areas. And I think that's going to happen in, in LA. LA County um, has already voted right to, to follow LA City. That's all the unincorporated parts of the county. Uh, Santa Monica might be in the lead in this situ in this uh, filling in on a regional basis. But um, from what I hear, it's going to be followed at least by some other uh, cities. And eventually, my guess is by all of them, because they all face these same pressures. I think Burbank, for example, um, will find that, and the employers there will find that a much bigger pool of jobs in, in, uh, and employees can apply to in LA at a higher wage will put pressure on them to raise their wages too. Okay, thank you. Yes? Is there any data on how this will affect the uh, cost of goods? Cost of goods? Like the food that we buy to run the restaurants. Right, so um, agriculture will, you know, in California would, would be affected if there's a statewide minimum wage increase and not by a local one because there just isn't that many uh, farms in, in, in Santa Monica or in Los Angeles, right? So, so I, 
there are there's some food processing manufacturing within cities that tends to be local um, and so they would have a small increase in their prices too but not something that I think I'd be worried about because it's, uh, it, it's small relative to the whole industry to the whole economy yeah uh, regarding uh, tipped employees in the restaurants for a minute can we talk about that on um, full service restaurants yeah in one particular I'm thinking one in particular 20 servers and there's about eight or ten people behind the counter those servers uh, with their tips are making far greater than the fifteen dollars an hour right their wage is let's say nine dollars an hour as an mm -hmm. example so the proposal that I've heard is that tipped employees will be exempt if they're already earning over fifteen dollars an hour now the, and I want to see your view on that or what or how That's not me, that's in the back. Yeah, how <laughs> LA City handled that. What if there's a conflict with federal law because federal law says you have to impute 15% of their 15% uh, of, of their sales into their 1099s and is there right. a conflict there? So uh, the recommendation I've heard is to exempt uh, tipped employees who are or already earning over $15 when you take into consideration their tips. Right, you sound very informed. I mean, at least well, about this one restaurant. But you know, the the, um, the idea that tip workers are very well paid might be true for a small section of, uh, and is true for especially upper end restaurants. Um, I know a lot of those people myself, so I've heard it from them personally. But it's not true for all tipped workers. So uh, the, well, the policy said. question is really got to look at the entire picture and. Of course, tip worker tipping is very uncertain in, in its amount. Um, the usual uh, point that you that I've heard you I hear you making, and our usual instance I hear it from other restaurant owners, is that the uh, the back of the house workers, I guess that's the cooks and dishwashers, and, uh, are are paid are not getting tips. They're not sharing in the tips, and um, it, there's nothing to prevent the tips of the tipped workers from pooling their tips with the people in the back of the house. That, wait, wait a second, that's voluntary, but we don't really know how much of that happens. Uh, in, in Oakland, which had a sudden increase, there's been a lot of publicity about, uh, and in some cases this happened, especially in the, about a half a dozen upscale restaurants, of moving to a service charge model where the tips you can't tip, you don't want or tips are discouraged. Instead, prices are increased by say 20%, which is the amount the tips would have been. And then that money presumably can be shared more equitably among the whole um, staff. And uh, I, you know, I talked to several management people at such restaurants, owners at such restaurants. And what happens with the service charge is now the tip, but what are the tips, which are the property of the employee, are the property of the employer legally and it's up to the employer to spend those service charges not not required to on on wages and up to the uh, restaurant owner to decide how to distribute them among the different workers so in one case there were different percentages to the more experienced and better workers and the newer workers and different for the servers and for the people in the back of the house and it got very complex I, I think the state law is a little ambiguous and could be clarified here, at least that's what Senator Leno told, told me when I was uh, testifying in Sacramento in April, and the same question came up. Uh, legally, uh, in California, you cannot uh, pay uh, servers less than the minimum wage. There's no tip credit that's allowed. You're, you're talking about something a little, a, a little different um, but I'm not sure, if, if, I'm just not sure of the legality of that, and that's not my area. No, but the city council is going to be looking at you for recommendations. No, not to me, not to me. Well, they're going to be looking at somebody coming forward, making a right, recommendation, right. and the reason we're having a meeting today is to come up with right. input from people, uh, restaurant people here. Well, I told you right at the beginning that I'm talking about the broad economics. You're not, well, thank not you the that. legal, I'm not, I'm not an attorney. I know, but there's some yeah, people here sure. that are taking notes. 
So that was that's one area, and I would like to put that recommendation on the table. Okay. And that if it's proven 15, I already said that. Second thing is, that comes up is uh, property managers. Property managers usually raise, as a general rule, a third of the rent goes towards their compensation plus at an hourly wage of roughly, let's in this case, $50, 50 hours a month times roughly $10 an hour. Now, uh, state law, as I understand, you cannot apply that rent credit towards a compensation. What is your view on that? What would you recommend that be done? Well, for, first of all, <clears throat> My job is to provide impact analysis, not to make recommendations. I mean, it's, it's not, we're, we're not advocates of one policy or another. We, ex we are given the numbers as academics and tell you what the impact would be. So it will be very, be very clear about that. I didn't choose what minimum wages Los Angeles should apply. The city did not, by the way, have uh, the policy that you talked about for for uh, servers and restaurants. It, it, they instead chose to delay the policy for a year for small businesses, that, that, as I mentioned. So that was under, certainly under discussion, and that's how, what the outcome was. And that issue has been under discussion about tipped workers in almost every case that I know of. And uh, in California, at least, I don't know of any, any uh, policy among all the cities that has given special uh, treatment to, to people who are servers in, in, in restaurants. And lastly, was there any minimum amount of employees upon which the minimum wage does not apply? Like No, no. So it applies to all employees without regard to how many? That's right, yeah. Now in some cities, there were exemptions at first. For example, San Francisco delayed the implementation of the policy for employers with fewer than 10 employees for two years. Uh, Santa Fe had a bigger exemption, I think as many as 500 employees, but no, 25 employees uh, at first, and then they changed the law a few years later. Seattle has also you know, put in a variety of different schedules over, over the years, 20, but everyone eventually reaches $15 in, in, in those cases. Yeah. I think uh, I'm from Pioneer Magnetics, and as I tell everybody, we're the last of the Mohicans, but we do have manufacturing. Uh, just as a reference, probably about 10, 15 years ago, we had probably close to 650 employees in Santa Monica. We have about 125 now. Uh, there's about 325 now that we contract out to various foreign venues. And we are definitely in favor of increasing the minimum wage. But I'd like to share some information with you, just really quickly, if I may. Um, right now, the hourly average at Pioneer is around $16 an hour, somewhere in that area, $16, $17 an hour. And we'd like to pay more, except we're unable because of just uh, the cost of doing business. As a comparison, uh, Mexico, we do work in, in many offshore venues, and Mexico, as a comparison to our $16, like, let me give you another number. Uh, if we totally burdened, put all the overhead on that, it's around $40, $45 an hour that we would pay. And uh, as compared to Mexico, let's say it's around $10 an hour. Uh, Malaysia is around $7 an hour. China is soon going to be $5 an hour. So with this increase, uh, we'd like to pay that increase. Uh, it can get us to around $50 an hour, and you compare that $50 an hour to uh, China, which is $5 an hour, the incentive, unfortunately, is to continue uh, offloading more work, which then reduces the workforce. Uh, there's another thing, too, just as a comparison, is that uh, for a product that we build, in fairly large quantities, uh, we sell somewhere around $1,200 to $1,500 each. And we have a competitor who's offshore who manufactures in China, and they're around $300. So you've got, let's say, $1,200, $1,500 to $300. And I, I just heard yesterday that this particular competitor is going um, to try to get that $300 number to $250. And so 
when we talk about uh, increasing the wage, I think a lot of us really would like to do that. But for particularly manufacturing, uh, it's going to be more and more difficult to maintain these jobs here in Santa Monica. Thank you. Right. Right. Yeah, next question. Yeah, did, did your studies about retail differentiate between small mom and pop, single employee, couple of employees, and the larger corporate retail, even if they're not the huge ones, mm -hmm. like Target. On Main Street, we've got some small corporate chains, and we've got some, but what we generally refer to as mom and pop. You know, the statistical um, agencies in the United States have really had their budgets cut over the last 25 or 30 years. We lag behind Europe and much of Latin America in the kinds of analyses that we can do. Where especially ones that link workers to employee um, employers uh, over time, and we just don't have the capacity. Or I, don't, I shouldn't say we, but the fiscal agencies don't um, uh, have a way for us to distinguish between uh, the small rest, small retailers and the large retailers. Uh, it's a it's a big gap. Is it fair to say that the corporate ones, even if they're smaller corporate ones, can absorb this better than the small mom and pops? Well, um, if they're corporate, they're probably franchises or owned by corporate, in which case there's a larger you know, pocket of cash that presumably can, can be break, broken out of here. I, I think rents are another big issue, you know, sure. um, as sure. well as labor. And I'm sure rents are higher in Santa Monica than in most of Los Angeles. Uh, and, and the other issue that one might raise here is franchise costs, franchise fees, and whether a corporate could absorb some of these cost increases by lowering their franchise costs, their, their franchise fees a bit. And I don't know whether that will happen, I just or, or that rents will adjust. I, I would, I don't have a theory or, and I don't have any data to say how much of that will happen, but those are potential uh, channels. But, I mean, is it fair to say that the mom and pop ones could oh, conceivably be hurt more than the Well, f first of all, um, generally I would say that the ones that are, that are part of larger companies generally are, are more compliant with minimum wage laws. When we look at the pattern of violations or, or lack of compliance, uh, you see much better record at Walmart or Burger King, precisely because they are large corporate entities and they don't want to violate the law. Not, not to say the compliance is 100%, but it's higher than at a lot of the mom and pop stores. Um, on the other hand, and I didn't get into this in the talk, the, um, the benefits of, of minimum wages are going to be concentrated spatially. That is, lo most low-wage workers, even if they live in, or let's say they don't live in Santa Monica, but across the border in LA, they're going to live. They live in poor neighborhoods because they tend to, you know, live where the rents are lower, right, or where their um, family, uh, friends, or relatives, or ethnic group is concentrated, and so. The, the percent increase in, in income in those neighborhoods will be much higher, and the spending will be much higher. And so for especially a lot of the immigrant mom and pops in Koreatown or you know, Chinatown or, or wherever are going to see a much bigger increase in sales than, than they can forecast because of the big increase in consumer income in those neighborhoods. And uh, the, where the costs are are going to be more are going to be felt in the more affluent neighborhoods because they tend to spend more, whether it's on retail or on restaurants. It's a smaller percentage, but um, they are much bigger in, in, in overall consumption. <clears throat> yeah. I know there's no way to know the exact number, but I was just curious what the the 20 year average CPI might look like. You know, if five years out we're at $15, 
What does it look like in, at six years or 10 years? Well, right now, inflation is about 2%, or actually running a little under 2%. 10 years ago, I think it was a little bit higher, 3 or 4%. Um, uh, before that, it was in the 5 or 6%, maybe uh, 5%. So you can do the, the math. You know, it's uh, you, you might get a 20-year rolling average might be 4%, whereas the actual rate of inflation this year is under 2%. Just as a quick back of the envelope, back of my brain calculation. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, I was wondering yeah. if uh, there has been any study conducted to see the economic impact of uh, uh, not uh, awarding the minimum wage to uh, restaurant workers that are already earning fifteen dollars or more. I mean, first. I understand you said that the full service restaurant model was uh, maybe a small sector of the restaurant industry. Uh, no, it's, it's about, uh, it's more than half of all restaurants. Okay, so yeah. in, in the full service model, about 60% uh, of yeah. the employees uh, of, of that model are getting a minimum wage raise, even though they're already making 15 to $40 an hour. Maybe 10% of those of the employees are now at close to minimum wage and get a big benefit. No, no, that's not quite right because, first of all, a lot of those back of the house workers aren't tipped workers. You're only talking about the tipped workers, I, I believe. And um, we can tell how much workers get in tips, and it's nothing like $40 for the average tipped worker. I know that there are many bartenders and many servers who make $100 a night or $200 a night on a good night, on a weekend night, and so on. So I'm not discounting what you know what you might think are the numbers, but that's a, that is a very small percentage of all the, of all the tip workers who, who who make quite a bit from tips. Uh, well, actually, no. Yeah, I'm basing my numbers on only one yeah. one, one outfit, obviously. So, yeah. so globally, okay. they're going to change, but. Right. Uh, you know, generally you have between waiters and busboys that are also getting tips. That, that usually constitutes half or more of your staff in a full okay. service model. Right. Uh, then uh, of people that do not get tips, you have back of the house employees. And of those, you have, uh, I would say, the people that are now getting a minimum wage, um, there's only 10%, maybe, maybe, maybe dishwashers, mm -hmm. but cooks, and, and here is the reason I'm asking that, the, 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 the cooks, the people that work in the kitchen that are the ones that seem to be uh, the one in the, in the worst uh, position in the restaurant model because they are the ones that work two jobs. They, they, they work in one restaurant in the morning, they run to the other restaurant at night. Those are the people that are now making above minimum wage, 12, 13, 14. And so I guess what I was wondering, it'd be great to know if under a model where uh, these cooks could actually benefit of a raise as opposed to the tipped employees that are already making money are benefiting. Well, well first of all, there's nothing limiting you from raising their pay now, right? Well, and that, economics. That's economics. Economics, well, okay, maybe you can't because your competitor isn't. Um, uh, we, we've looked at statistically and how much earnings go up in full service versus limited service restaurants. We can't distinguish, no. There is one study by one of my colleagues that looks at tip workers, um, but doesn't look at the non-tip workers, unfortunately. So we don't see any, any big differences. Uh, and we certainly don't see a change in employment numbers in, in full service restaurants compared to limited or in limited service restaurants. So I'm not saying your model wouldn't work, um, but I know that the current model doesn't show in any big impact when minimum wages go up. Uh, there's hundreds of minimum wage studies that have been performed and about um, Half of them are on team workers who are less and less representative of, of the minimum wage labor force. 
I didn't show up, show the demography of who, get, who's, who benefits, but in LA we found that only 3% of the workers would be teens. And more, the more representative workers are ones who are in their 30s, who even have some college education and who support their families. And, and uh, the other half of studies are on restaurants, because these are the two groups where there's the biggest impact. And, and there's some controversy among economists about this, as, as there often is, but nobody finds a big effect on restaurants, on restaurant employment. You're asking you know, us to drill down even further to the model that you're talking about, and I can't answer that because I don't know any studies of that sort. So there's no study that, that, that addresses the fact? No, there are studies that compare states that have a tip credit with states that don't have a tip credit. 43 states have tip credits. In some states, the minimum wage is $2.13 for tip workers. In others, it's four fifty. California, Oregon, Washington, uh, Alaska, and Hawaii, and I think Montana, and maybe one other state. Minnesota, Minnesota thank you. Um, don't allow a tip credit. So we have a lot of variation across the country in tip credits, and we don't see uh, um, big, big effects, uh, positive effects in the states that have more tip credits. What happens with a tip credit is you're effectively through your tip paying part of the wages of the employee. It's not really an extra income because the employer can deduct that from the wages that they're, they're, uh, they have to pay to, to the employee. So, um, so, you know, and then, yeah, uh, what can I say? I mean, Seattle, or, or sorry, the state of Washington has been at $9.32 minimum wage for some time in restaurant employment growth, full service employment restaurant growth is no different from in states, you know, where there's a big tip credit. So, but again, that's not quite the study you're asking about or asking to, us to do, uh, but I don't know that we have the data, you know, unless somebody actually has such a policy in place, we have to go to these other uh, ways of looking at it through the interstate differences in, in tip credits. Yeah. Hi, I'm aware of the fact that the mayor and council aren't in the room. Would, do you know that if there will be any other opportunity for public comment before this meeting at the end of September? I'll let's, uh, see if the people from the city can tell us. So we've got another meeting next week. There'll be a nonprofit meeting. We had raised the minimum wage in 2004 from what was the state minimum wage at 675 and went up to 850. And that was indexed to the CPI. Now it's a ten, some, it was a ten something, and then it just got raised again to twelve twenty five uh, last month by last November's ballot. So that increase from six seventy five to eight fifty is twenty seven or thirty percent increase, I think. So there have been quite a few that are at that level, and we looked at uh, restaurant employment in San Francisco and a neighboring uh, county in parts of Alameda County. And we also looked at small restaurants that were exempt for the first two years compared to other restaurants. And we couldn't find any negative employment effects. We found a positive earnings effect for sure. Uh, there was wage compression. And we did find this decline in turnover uh, that, that I mentioned. Um, the federal minimum wage was raised by 50% in 1950. Um, from 40 cents to 80 cents, I think it was. <laughs> so, and, and we just don't have data that far back that could really tell us what, what the impact was. I wish there were. So, so there been, uh, th there'll be a lot more of these studies now in a couple of years when we have these bigger increases that we've been talking about. But uh, uh, the, the other way to do such a study is to look at uh, states where the federal increases have had a big impact on the state because it's a low wage state. So even if the federal increase is, say, 15% per year uh, for a couple of years, in a state like Mississippi or Alabama, a really poor state, given the, minimum, the median wage in those states, it's a much bigger impact than in a rich state, right? And so there's one study I know of that found that, yes, when the ratio of the minimum wage to the median wage went up 
over 55 percent there seemed to be a bigger negative employment effect but it wasn't statistically significant and that's because there were just not enough observations you know you only have Mississippi and Alabama and South Carolina there but also found a significant increase in the earnings of low-wage workers those even bigger in in those states so when you look at the net benefits compared to the cost say in this case the benefits are the increased income to the low-wage community and you compare that to the loss of employment potential you know possible loss of employment then the benefit cost ratio didn't change even when the minimum wage went up as much as it did but we have also experience from Europe but it's sort of again very difficult to to extract we know that in France the minimum wage is over 60 percent of the a little bit over 60 percent of median full-time wage but because that's true nationally it's very hard to do any statistical analyses Germany is just instituted a minimum wage of 58 percent of the median the UK the Conservative Party in the UK has just announced it's raising the minimum wage from 50 percent of the median full-time wage to 60 percent in my in our analysis we LA was going to go up about 63 percent I think it was so so there seems to be this trend toward having higher ratios yeah have there been any studies in similar municipalities that rely so heavily on tourism that are smaller cities you know where it's such a high percentage of business income is tied so closely to tourist dollars yeah so everyone thinks San Francisco is a tourist city or even LA because you know everyone wants to come and see Hollywood and stars homes and so on and there is a lot of tourism but when you look at the industrial distribution of activity in those cities tourism is actually not the driving sector for Santa Monica it might be or for what's that city in in Florida with Disney World Orlando you know it might be and in that situation it would make sense to to distinguish the tourist sector because the prices that the I'm sorry the effect on the tourist sector is vital because it's bringing in so much outside income if tourists spent less because of the price increases then that would hurt the tourist city if the minimum wage goes up 10% but they're spending goes down by 15 you know percent that would that would that would overall hurt you because if that was the impact and I don't know if there are any studies that have looked at how minimum wages have affected tourism so it's safe so it's safe to say that's an unknown variable correct yeah because you'd have to know what the response is to the price increase and we could infer it from say changes in exchange rates because we know that when the dollar becomes cheaper for Japanese or French or German tourists more of them come to the United States right and when it becomes more expensive for them the fewer come and so you could one could do such a calculation but I haven't done it or I haven't seen one either thank you I just want to go back to the statistical numbers as far as percentage of um, different workforces that it impacts. Um, I saw on your first slide, if you went back to your first slide, it shows restaurants, but I didn't, I didn't see hospitality broken out, and I was just trying, wanted to make sure I was understanding what was the hospitality side. Hospitality is accommodations and food services usually. So it's a, that's a combined number, that's 17%? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and maybe some other ancillary. Uh, industries as well but the, the way the, the way that your local economic development agency might organize the statistics is differently from how the US government does but, so they don't have an actual industry called hospitality or, or tourism they have accommodations that food services and you can you know convention centers are obviously part of hospitality as well so I assume too that that within a tourist city Obviously, there's a much higher percentage of that in Santa Monica than there would be as far as distribution or population of the overall workforce in LA or other cities. Well, yeah, that's what my point was that there was more, there were more restaurants 
uh, more employment in restaurants and accommodations yeah. in Santa Monica than in LA, and I think it's because of the tourism, that for sure, yeah. Uh, so for the benefit of the city, that would be an interesting number to have as far as within Santa Monica, just to understand that kind of is overall populace. Yeah, the other side of, of Santa Monica being an expensive city is that, I'm sorry, a tourist city is expensive, but so the tourist city is that the costs would be disproportionately paid by, by uh, non-residents, yeah. right? You know, so, so that's why you often see high uh, fees tacked on in, for hotels or for uh, airport uh, rental cars and so on. This, uh, the cities are trying to capture some of that from, from foreign people outside the city. <clears throat> As to uh, Los Angeles on the construction uh, employees, are they, how, what kind of enforcement are they doing on the subcontractors with the uh, wage employees of the, uh, the carpenters and you know wallboard people and painters, etc., who are not the, the contractors or the subcontractors? Are you talking about prevailing wage laws in, in construction or, or? Or minimum wage. No, minimum wage, minimum wage. because okay. prevailing is just basically. So, so at this point, the city does not have an enforcement office. It's going to create one. Remember, even going up to 1050 will not happen until next, next July, and they'll only have five employees to, to start with. So this um, enforcement is conducted entirely at the state, you know, by state uh, Department of Labor Standards Enforcement and also by the Wage and Hour Division of the U.S. Department of Labor. And I think in both cases, there's been an increase in inspectors at the federal and state level, and that they have tried to target industries where they know there's quite a few uh, problems. Like, uh, I know the famous ones both here in New York are in, in the car wash, the car wash industry, for example. So. But definitely, an enforcement is an issue, and I think it needs to be addressed. You know, I think we have a lot of unique situations in Santa Monica, and tourism is certainly part of it. Uh, the transit, transit and occupancy tax is a big part of our general fund. But the other part on your slides says about as the wages go up, spending goes up. but. In reality, because of our housing issues here, many of our frontline and hospitality workers don't spend and live in this city. So right. you have that, that offset is not there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. If they don't live in the city, they're not going to spend a lot in the city. But even for um, workers who live in, and work in Los Angeles, rent, uh, and certainly in San Francisco and in Oakland, rents are going up, housing rents. And that could eat up quite a bit of these minimum wage increases. They're going up for other reasons, right? Um, because of the tech boom in San Francisco, or, for example, and then the spillover into Oakland. Um, and the minimum wage is not a panacea that will solve the problems of, of, of people with low incomes, who have, or even middle incomes, who are spending so much on rent. That's absolutely true, yeah. Another question, uh, have there been any studies on Increasing the minimum wage as it results, or I'm sorry, as it relates to uh, black market labor. So, for example, yeah. and the way that that's enforced, mm -hmm. um, you know, paying people under the table uh, right. for smaller businesses or um, even bigger businesses. Yeah, I, I remember that when the minimum wage, uh, first the one minimum wage was being talked about in San Francisco in 2003 or even earlier. That the Chinatown Progressive Association said, "Why bother? That nobody pays the minimum wage anyway. So if you raise it, there's not going to be any effect." You know. <laughs> and, and some people have asked me, "Isn't that why you don't see an employment effect? Because nobody's actually getting getting the increase." But in, <laughs> but in point of fact, there, we have two sources of data on what employers pay, uh, or what and what workers receive. One is employer-based data, data that they have to report on the so-called ES-202 form to the Employment Development Department, and, um, and, and which is the basis of unemployment insurance tax. And, and uh, quite a few employers are, are compliant on that. Not all of them are, obviously. Um, and the second source is household surveys, the current population survey, the American community survey, the two biggest ones in the US right now. 
And from both of them, when we look at those uh, sources after a minimum wage increase, we find an earnings increase that we can measure. It's, it's, and it's about the range that we think it should be given what the wage distribution is uh, under the new minimum wage. So uh, even if compliance doesn't go uh, up, it doesn't go down. It doesn't seem to go down either. So even with imperfect compliance in some black market economy, there are a lot of people who are getting higher pay. That, that, that's, that we see in both kinds of surveys. And it just we don't think that would happen if, there, if it all was at the Chinatown Progressive Association with, with complaining about. That's and of course, enforcement. I, I think the San Francisco has a model enforcement agency with a, quite a few employees, a lot of community involvement, and some very highly publicized uh, settlements. And, and uh, these are very effective, I think, in, 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 in increasing compliance. It was a two-part question, kind of. Um, the second part is, is there any data that shows how it relates to um, independent contractor income? There's a lot of talk about uh, the labor market moving towards an on-demand model where there's an yeah. increase in, you know, 1099 employees who right. perhaps should be classified as employees. Right. But there, there's two different questions that really in there. One is, should, are they being misclassified? <clears throat> which is a big focus of attention in the Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Labor, and the California uh, Department of Labor as, as well. And, and the State Department has been very uh, out front in saying that many categories of, mis of, a, of a independent contractors should be employees. Uh, so, so that is a problem and is being addressed to some extent, but it's only the, you know, it's a long way to go on uh, resolving that. So for those of you who are not familiar with this, independent contractors um, are sometimes classified that way as a way to avoid employers paying benefits and taxes uh, for those employees. And of course, it creates an unlevel playing field for those who do properly calculate or include those as employees. And both the Department of Labor and the IRS have a whole set of, of uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, requirements to be an independent contractor as opposed to an employee. Um, like, you have to own your own tools, you have to set your own work time, you, you know, I, I don't have time to go into it in all the details. And so uh, we know that the proportion of independent contractors has, go has gone up in the U.S. in the years when there's been less enforcement. Not so much because the minimum wage has gone up, or because now Uber and, you know, and other type services exist. So the second part of your question is, are those kinds of situations increasing because of, of uh, the kind of matching algorithms that Uber or, or Airbnb, you know, or, or what is it, TaskRabbit, you know, have? And yes, they're increasing, but they're still a very, very small part of, of the total uh, labor, labor force. And there's some evidence that some of these um, companies are going the other way. It's switching their independent contractors to being employees. But I think that's very much still up in the air and, and will probably resolve more in the courts and administrative agencies than, than any other way. Okay. Thank you.